And as we know far too well, routine doctor's visits are associated with better health care outcomes, and they're also a cornerstone of our preventative health. So how might we incentivize and promote, pro promote preventative health and encourage early diagnosis? We'll spend the next portion of our program taking a deeper dive into the issue of preventative health care and innovations in patient care as well as access. And joining me to kick off that part of the discussion is Dr. Dora Hughes. She is the Chief Medical Officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Let me begin with COVID-19 and, and, and really get your overall sense of how that has changed or impacted preventative care for so many Americans. I, I would answer that in at least two ways. I'm sure there's more, but uh, and first, it really helped to shine a light on prevention. I think even as much uh, as we talk about prevention and health promotion and the activities that are needed, uh, still, we take it for granted. Uh, too many Americans still are not going to get the recommended preventive care. And so in terms of the pandemic, we, saw, we were reminded again, it's not just the COVID vaccination, uh, which in and of itself was life-saving, um, but it was a reminder about all the other immunizations that uh, historically and currently have really enabled uh, Americans to live longer, live healthier, uh, live more productive lives. And so I think that the COVID pandemic, again, just reminded all of us of the importance of prevention. Uh, but on a, on a second level, it also reminded us again about the disparities in the system, uh, that too many Americans don't have the access they need to preventive care, and that, that may be because they don't have uh, uh, insurance coverage or their insurance coverage is not robust enough, or it may be more practically that they don't live in an area where there's enough uh, providers who can provide the preventive care. Maybe they have issues with transportation. Uh, and we know that uh, a number of uh, populations are more likely to have these barriers to getting preventive care. Uh, certain racial and ethnic groups, certain uh, low uh, uh, groups that don't have a high enough income in certain rural areas, those with disabilities, we can go on and on, but there's a number of populations that especially have trouble accessing uh, the needed care. Uh, and between the two, a uh, reminder of the importance of prevention and understanding that some groups especially have barriers trying to access preventive care, that has really helped to influence our work at CMS broadly and certainly at the CMS Innovation Center uh, where I work. Well, let me follow up on that point, because it is obvious preventative care is, is a lot cheaper than going to the hospital. So often, so many Americans use the ER as their primary care physician. How do we get to the point where we are reaching those who need it the most, who need that preventative care? I'll give you one example of what we found in one of our models. Um, to your point where there is reliance, over-reliance on the emergency department instead of going to see uh, the primary care provider. In this case, it was at a hospital in Reading, Pennsylvania, and uh, our colleagues there locally shared a story of a family, a young mother, she had a child who was five, who on his 17th visit to the emergency department, the 17th visit, uh, for non-emergent reasons, uh, the uh, staff in the hospital screened the family for social needs. Uh, and in this case, they found that the family was struggling with mold in the housing. They didn't have heat. They're relying upon uh, the stove for, for heat. Uh, they had um, <clears throat> difficulties with transportation. All of these uh, different factors together made their, their personal situation very difficult made it very difficult for them to go in and see their primary care provider. Uh, and and long-term was having an impact on their health and healthcare utilization. Long story short, I won't go into it, but by one of our initiatives, our, one of our models, the Accountable Health Communities model, uh, the staff in the emergency room linked the family up with social services within a relatively short period of time. They were able to get their housing situation squared away. They were able to get uh, legal help to help with the landlord. They were able to get transportation needs addressed. All of that, that not only drove down how often they had to uh, show up in the emergency room for non-emergent reasons, but it also improved their health outcomes for the child and for the mother. So we're pretty excited about 
being very deliberate and linking, trying to integrate clinical interventions with community health interventions so that we know that our beneficiaries are receiving holistic care that in the end will pay off both uh, in terms of their health, but also the financial uh, cost to the healthcare system. Dr. Hughes, as we uh, heard earlier from Dr. Stephen McMillan, uh, Hologic, which is uh, our sponsor of this, talking about the use of technology and really how that can break through in so many different areas to get to the patients to deal with some of this preventative health care. So I'm wondering if you can address that issue, how you think technology more broadly will impact health care moving forward. Now, that's such an excellent question, and we're excited about, again, the work that uh, we're supporting across CMS, but certainly through the Innovation Center. And I think it helps to piggyback on your last question about what did we learn during COVID? Uh, and one that healthcare providers across the whole range of providers were able to, uh, to support telehealth regardless of the clinical setting, and that the patients were able to, uh, to take full advantage of telehealth and across the spectrum, we always have this notion that is younger, more educated Americans, but we saw even for our elderly, our senior beneficiaries and others that they too were able to tap into telehealth. And that really helped to uh, expand access to providers. They were able to get healthcare advice and guidance uh, on a more timely basis. They were able to make their appointments. They were able to um, uh, receive education uh, more easily, more guidance from uh, the doctors, nurses, and others. Um, so we really think that that, again, helps to underscore the importance of telehealth as one technology. And in newer areas, I mean, certainly in for primary care internal medicine, but also for behavioral health that we know across the nation, there's a shortage of, of mental health and behavioral health providers. Uh, technology through telehealth is, was critically important in really expanding access uh, to a number of uh, different populations, particularly those in rural areas uh, as one example. So we, we think that um, uh, in the, within the context of providing greater access to providers, who in many areas are in short supply, is there's no better example of how technology can help to improve health and health care. You have been on the front lines of public health, your work now at CMS, but also your nonprofit work at the Milken Institute at uh, George Washington University here in Washington, DC. I'm wondering, based on your expertise, is there a way to incentivize access to public health? Yes, and that's a, that is, to your point, an area of intense focus here at the CMS Innovation Center. We're approaching it in three different ways. Uh, the first is through some of our work, we are looking directly uh, at different preventive services and how can we do more. As one example, through our Million Hearts Initiative, is there a way that doctors, uh, how, that we can facilitate the provision of cardiovascular health uh, screening, uh, information, preventive care uh, through our research? How can we help doctors provide this care? Uh, we're doing the same uh, through our model that was focusing on the diabetes prevention program. It's still a astounding to so many to understand that if you lose between five and 10% of your weight, you can drive down their risk of developing type two adult onset diabetes um, by in some cases more than 50%. Uh, and so how do, we, how do we scale up these interventions? That's, that's our charge. Like it's, it's one thing to be able to show this in a research lab or to show these in, in different pockets of uh, and in many communities across the nation, but how do we scale it up so all of us who may be at risk of diabetes in this example um, can take full advantage? And so, um, so at the center, we are focusing on specific conditions, certain disease areas where we know that preventive care will make a difference. But we're also thinking about who's, more, who's most likely to uh, provide preventive care. In that case, it's primary care physicians. We have substantially invested in improving uh, primary care. Uh, we know that it's a tough job to be a primary care provider. I know that I was one of them. Uh, and so how do we, how can we make the payment more flexible? How do, can we, uh, what are the technologies and tools and learning supports that we can provide? Um, is there additional payment, actually, uh, you know, monthly payments that can help to enhance the care? So that's a, another area. And the third and final area I mentioned just very briefly, again, we are laser focused on addressing the social needs of our patients. 
working very closely with our colleagues in public health, our colleagues in the social services sector, uh, thinking through how can all of us working together? What's the, what are the synergies that in the end can enable uh, greater access to preventive care for our beneficiaries? Let me conclude with uh, another issue that we've been talking about uh, as the president is encouraging all Americans to get the COVID booster shot, to get the flu vaccine. As you well know, there are a lot of questions, a lot of concerns and some uh, speculation that uh, vaccines don't work or can provide some uh, side effects that could be dangerous to the individual. Your message to those on the fence deciding whether, to not, whether or not to get the vaccines, whether it's for the flu or the COVID booster, your message is what? Uh, my very simple message would be sign up, go get your shot. Uh, but I would also say for those that have concerns in the CMS um, Center, we have m a considerable extraordinary amounts of data on our beneficiaries who, particularly those that were in nursing home settings and other institutional settings, uh, and those that are participating in our Medicare program, those that are Medicaid, we are able to see firsthand through these data analyses, just again, the life-saving uh, effect of the vaccinations. Those that received the shots, how they uh, how they have fared compared to those that have not. Uh, it's just very, very compelling. I would also have to also say here at CMS, we work very closely with our colleagues in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as in the Food and Drug Administration, a number of other agencies. Uh, where we're relying with their, on their relationships very closely with the communities on the ground, uh, with the community-based organizations, the faith-based institutions, um, uh, those in schools, those that are trusted messengers and could provide even more assurance and confidence than, uh, than I am as, a, as a, a federal official here in Washington, D.C. We understand that these partnerships uh, with trusted messengers will just be critically important. Uh, even as we are facing the next wave of, of COVID and flu and other um, illnesses this winter. So Dr. Hughes, in our final minute, in a sentence or two, the mission statement of the CMS Innovation Center is what? The mission of the CMS Innovation Center is to test innovative care delivery and payment models uh, that can uh, help us achieve our goal of an equitable health system that's providing high quality, affordable, and person-centered care to every American. Dr. Dora Hughes, she is the Chief Medical Officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Thanks so much for being with us here today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.